Okay, so this next section we're going to be talking about our quality for street design. It's going to be a little bit more of the applications of some of those things you saw in the first part. And then we're going to go into case studies. Uh, Dorsey Clark at the City of Dallas is going to be talking about some of the case studies in her city, and then I'll cover some additional case studies in this region. Um, so this portion we're really going to be talking about, I'll show you some standard design, you know, what you typically see on different types of streets, and then some alternative ways to do these things. We're mostly focusing on the water quality aspect, of course, but it does feed into this larger narrative uh, that's going around about creating these sustainable, walkable communities um, that attract people and businesses and make it just a better place to live. All these applications are going, going to apply to all of your streets, but you know, keep an open mind and start thinking about places where they possibly could apply. Um, I've broken this out into different sections based on the type of streets, um, arterials, and collectors, highways, and then highly urbanized streets are going to be kind of under that tri-swim um, guidance, and then the residential streets, again, those are kind of under the, the I-swim criteria right manual. And again, different types of streets call for different solutions, but the solutions that we'll be showing, you know, for each of these case, uh, each of these street types, they're not only applicable here. Every street's different, and if you see something under arterials and collectors that work in your residential, that's fine too. So, I'm going to start off with arterials and collectors. Um, these are, you know, your busier streets. They got a lot of traffic on them, and they're focused on moving people from these local areas into more of the highways, um, and typically along commercial properties. This is one of just a standard detail that I pulled, a standard cross-section of a regular arterial and collector. You see, you know, just the sidewalk, parkway, the raised crown up into the median, and then goes back down the raised median. So not a lot of room for applications of water quality. Um, you're pretty much directing water directly into a curb and gutter system. In practice, this is pretty much what it looks like. Um, it's very car-centric design. Um, there are sidewalks and areas for pedestrians, but it's not necessarily a place that pedestrian would want to walk. Um, you know, if you had to walk half a mile to your grocery store, and this was your view, it wouldn't necessarily motivate you to do that. So here's some alternatives. Um, Here's, a, here's an area where they directed the flow. There's just a regular inlet right here, except that inlet doesn't go into a pipe system. What it does is it outfalls directly into this vegetated swale or bioretention area. Uh, this can be placed either inside or outside of the sidewalk. Um, if it's placed you know, on the street side, that helps create a nice pedestrian buffer between the people walking on the street and the cars. Um, it does require a little bit more right-of-way, which might be one of the concerns, but it could also be if you're backed up to businesses, you can use, um, you know, businesses' landscaping requirements to be fulfilled by putting these buffer zones in here, um, if that's something that you're willing to work with them on. Also, mediums are a great place to use some of these applications if you can't do it on your right-of-way on the, near the sidewalks. Then if you have a vegetated median, you can either use curb cuts or similar to the other one, just use an inlet with a false back that outfalls right into the median um, and use that vegetated area to be able to treat some of your water quality. Highway design, so that's arterials and collectors. Uh, going into highway design, kind of focused on two different types. There's you know, rural highways and urban highways. They have much different water quality applications that are available to them. Um, and then different aspects and challenges to each one of those. High mobility, uh, low degree of access, and then multiple lanes with or without a median. This is just kind of a standard, uh, more rural cross-section of what your typical highway design would look like with the, the depressed median and then depressed sides and onto the front of the roads. So I was going to start with rural highways because it's pretty easy. You don't have to do much for rural highways when it comes to water quality. They're already pretty good. Um, you know, you're draining directly into these grassy swales. It's running across um, these grassy areas for quite a while until it reaches one of your creeks. And that does an amazing amount for water quality. You wouldn't think that something as simple as just run it across grass um, would do much, but it actually does quite a bit. Um, urban highways are a little more challenging, um, especially when you get into situations like this where you really are you know, maximizing your right away to the fullest extent possible. You're trying to get as many lanes as you can, squeeze it into um, a very tight area. This definitely limits, you're not going to have inlet level 
kind of water quality treatment here. You're not going to have you know those curb cuts and things like that. A grassy swale is going to be hard to fit in in these scenarios. So when you're looking at these ultra urban highways, you're really starting to look at outfall protections. What could you do at the outfall of these um, to treat some water quality? Uh, there's you know the standard dry detention, which is very common in this region, but also if you want to look at kind of upping the game on that and doing an extended detention or even a micro pool where there's just a small pool located at the at the outfall that kind of boosts up your water quality treatment um, for those applications. And then also, you know, you can have your flood control involved in this as well. You can size those for the flood control storm. If you have some space, um, particularly between, you know, your, your main lanes and then your frontage road, this was actually um, part of a proposal that we did for a job on ways to incorporate water quality into a, a large highway design. And, you know, a lot of times there's these sloped areas or offsite areas. You have these retaining walls um, holding them back. And, you know, we thought of the idea of perhaps putting in an additional retaining wall and making part of this um, a bioretention area. Um, it would look like just regular landscaping to the people driving by, but you could also get a good amount of water quality treatment out of that and then connect it into any existing system or proposed system um, on the front of the road. When you can maintain a grassy median, uh, you know, that's probably going to be the easiest and cheapest way to get some water quality benefits out of your highways. Um, here's one example. One more people might be familiar with this. I don't know if anybody drives this every day. This is a PGBT. Uh, so we can tell they've left a very substantial grassy median there. Um, they put the little indicators to let you know where <laughs> some of the inlets and things like that are. But um, you know, there is some water quality aspect with that. Moving on to highly urbanized areas, um, kind of the same with those ultra urban highways. We're talking about very confined places, um, you know, <coughs> the building pavement. You go straight from the buildings into your sidewalks, into your roadways. Not a lot of room for um, a lot of vegetative areas. But there's also heavy pedestrian traffic too that you want to take into account. Um, some things that other cities are doing that we've seen around the nation is using these planter boxes, is essentially what they're calling them, or little vegetated swales. Um, these are interesting because they can either be used during design, you know, you can design them into your system, or they can also be used as a retrofit as well. They don't necessarily have to have um, the you know storm drain system or under drain system under here. You can use them just as a method of running water across them. Have a you know an inlet section over here, and then have it outfall into an existing inlet um, mm -hmm. down there. So also helps create that pedestrian buffer makes a little bit nicer scenery if you are in an area with um, shops or restaurants you want to put tables and chairs outside. Um, another example, very similar concept, you know, you have the, the inlets and then this one is a little bit deeper, helps also with, um, provides a little bit of retention or detention uh, to help reduce your time of concentration. So it'll help with your water quality, but it'll also help reduce some of the flooding that you're having in that region. Um, here's another example of just what it looks like from uh, further out. Um, you see just all these little inlets right here feeding into these planter box systems. The great thing about these is usually you don't have to do this on your own. Um, there's a lot of cities already putting these applications in place and they're more than willing to share their information. The uh, city of Portland has all of their details, um, you know, standard details and specs online. Uh, they even have the DWG CAD files. You can just download the CAD files right offline and, and get these details. So this is actually for the one we were just showing with the, the intakes and the planner boxes. Um, also, it doesn't seem to pertain directly to street design, but rooftop runoff, especially in highly urbanized areas, is a large source of pollutants. Um, the roof catches things from birds flying overhead, which uh, contribute to quite a bit of the bacterial pollutants that we have. Um, but if you think about you know, putting one of those planter boxes on the side of a building um, instead of you know, on the sidewalk, then you can drain your rooftop directly to that planter box area, um, treat that rooftop runoff, have your overflow in it, but then you connect it 
just directly into your existing tunnel drain system. When it's too confined, when you just don't have the space and you don't have, you can't put in those planter boxes or things like that, you know, it's time to start considering things like coarse concrete for your uh, sidewalks and your bike paths. Um, and actually, you know, well, it's going to have a water quality as well as a water quantity benefit. You're going to get some infiltration to reduce the amount of runoff coming off of those things. And then, you know, the main concern with those is typically clogging. Um, how is the water quality going to be treated if these things get clogged? What kind of maintenance is that going to require? Um, but really, in these highly urbanized areas, they're less likely to get clogged. Because if they're going to get clogged, they're going to get clogged from sediments. Um, so if you had you know, any kind of runoff coming off of open land or you know, places with vegetated areas onto these coarse concrete, then it'd be much more likely to get um, clogged than it is just in an urban environment. Um, and then, you know, keep going down and down until you can't get any more. If you really have no space, uh, you probably at least have inlets. And there are things you can do with just your inlets uh, to treat water quality. Um, I'm sure some of you have seen these, you know, kind of tree inlet boxes um, that have a tree system right in there. And it kind of acts as an inlet and also helps water your tree. There's a little bit of um, detention space in there as well. And then it infiltrates and it goes right into your your inlet box. Also things like gravity and vortex separators, um, <coughs> hatch basin inserts, and then possibly underground um, infiltration detention. So moving on, uh, the last one is residential streets. Um, residential streets have kind of their own challenges with the um, access that you have to allow. Obviously there's a lot of driveways, um, so it kind of limits some of these applications, but you do have a larger amount of space usually to deal with as well. Um, again, when you can use the medians, they're a great um, application for these bioswales or grassy areas, and they're you know fairly easy. It's just kind of rethinking the design of which way are your streets tilting? Are they tilting towards the outside? Or are they tilting towards the inside? Um, and then also the right of way, creating these you know vegetated <coughs> areas, similar to what you saw in the arterials. And then these I really like; they're fairly popular in Portland. Um, they're called bump outs or curb extensions. Um, they use them as a retrofit design typically, but see the schematic. Um, again, there's no; these are essentially just vegetated areas that you know they pulled the concrete or asphalt out of the existing street put in these vegetated areas and it really just acts as kind of a pathway for the water to take. Um, there's no underdrain system there, there's no um, overflow system there. It just comes in to this little sediment floor bay and then you have kind of these uh, rock check dams to kind of back up the flow, increase the infiltration, um, and it's just a nice vegetated area that eventually comes out and discharges into an existing storm drain. Um, signage and is really important as far as educating the community when you start um, installing these. Also for maintenance aspects, hopefully you can try to recruit some of the residential members to help do some of the maintenance on these things. Let them know that it shouldn't just be, be mowed down. Um, and if you see it really gives a, a nice view of down the street. It's really just about as wide as a parked car, so you're not taking away too much um, accessibility into the street or too much parking, uh, you, know, you put them where you can. Uh, they're not going to be applicable in every situation, but there are some situations where they definitely will be. And again, standard details, uh, standard details and specs are available online. Really the only thing you want to consider changing is probably the landscaping. Um, we have very different landscaping needs here in Texas than they do up in Portland. Uh, so, encouraging design, design, what are other cities doing? Why are these applications showing up in other cities and why are they not showing up here as, as frequently? Um, well, providing standard details, that's a big step. A lot of um, you know, design engineers or developers are not going to want to put in the time or money to create their own standard details or specs. So, if you can give those to them or provide those to them, that helps. Um, offering developer incentives such as increased floor to area ratio or other land use code departures. That was one I found out of Seattle that they're actively doing to try to encourage some of this design. 
Um, and then providing some financial assistance. Austin's um, kind of started this program where they'll help provide some financial assistance to um, developers or to companies that will help institute some of these street design practices. Um, other things that you can do to encourage uh, these practices, again, is providing alternative standards or details, or even if you just say which ones you're accepting. Um, I mean, it's, it's easy if you review the City of Portland ones and you approve those, then just say that somewhere um, in your standard details that you approve these alternative options as well. Um, open communication between engineers, planners, and landscape architects, it really takes all of them, and they come in at different situations. Planners are really good on the forefront, getting these ideas um, implemented, you need the engineers to actually develop them. The landscape architects are, are very important. I can't stress that enough when it comes to uh, plant selection. They know a lot more about plants than engineers do. Um, and then talking as early as you can, getting you know, these things decided early on in the project, and communication with um, public and property owners to let them see the aspects, the benefits. Okay. One of the other things about the particularly Portland details or <coughs> things like that is not only plant material, but also we'll have to consider rainfall intensity. Yes. It, it's just very different yeah. here than it is there. So yeah. yeah, the design may, with some of the check dams and things like that, may have to uh, be modified for our area. Yes, yeah. They will have to be designed slightly different, but for the most part, the infiltration materials and the filter fabrics and things like that they use are, are applicable um, in several situations. But we do have, I mean, you know, Portland and Seattle and those kind of communities are known for their rain, but we actually do get much more rain than they do. We just get it all at once. And they get it you know, spread out over the entire year. Um, landscaping, um, again, landscape architect. <laughs> we have a few of those on staff and they've become very important to us when we're, we're doing these designs. Um, but there's also some um, help out there for, you know, if you're just trying to get a general idea of what kind of plants are going to be in these systems. There's the Iceland Landscaping Technical Manual, also the Texas Smartscape website, and the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. They do a lot of um, good work there, and they do a lot of um, practice applications as well. So you'll be able to see pictures of systems already in place. Um, a word on maintenance. I could give a lot of words on maintenance, but um, it would take up pretty much the, the rest of the day. So I'm just going to do a little bit. Um, ISOM does have this, you know, the standard maintenance practices that these applications would require. You know, everything from things you should do um, every few months to every year to every ten years to every, you know after a big storm event. Um, but really, what it gets into is who's responsible. That's usually what cities are the most concerned about. Um, and you know, for all you hear about who's going to be responsible, what am I going to have to do, it really comes down to three things. It's either going to be privately maintained, publicly maintained, or publicly maintained and be contracted out. <laughs> those are pretty much the only scenarios we see. So it's really determining which one of those uh, you're willing to take on. I will say that the most, one of the most important things you can do is start a location database. Um, not just for these things, but if you're going to start installing these BMPs, definitely you want to know where they're located. Um, really, you should hopefully have that started for almost all of your maintenance applications. Um, you would need to know where your maintenance crews are responsible um, for maintaining. Um, and then also training and signage. Um, that's going to be very important on these BMPs because you are talking about kind of a hidden filter media underneath most of these that you know a standard maintenance person isn't going to be able to see and might not fully understand the purpose behind it. So training is important, but really if you could just get signs on there that just gives a brief explanation of, you know, these plants are um, native plants, they're supposed to grow to this high, do not mow, um, that would provide um, a lot of benefit and hopefully help prevent a lot of maintenance issues later on. Um, one other thing that I'll say is important, even if everything um, was privately maintained, if you had a way of just saying, okay, all of these are going to be privately maintained, there's still things that you need to do from a city standpoint to make sure that those things are going to be maintained. Um, you know, ordinances that need to be in place that include 
what kind of maintenance has to occur, when inspection will be done, who's doing inspection, <coughs> what kind of enforcement um, you have behind these inspection and maintenance practices so you can step in if it's not being adequately maintained. We did give a class on this um, a year ago, a year and a half ago. It was a four-hour class. So we did do a four-hour purely maintenance class. Um, but if you go to the ice one website, and go, if you click on tools, then there will be training there. You can, you can watch that class. Um, I'll also say that on October 30th, um, right. COG is hosting another class. Um, it's on their sustainable public right-of-ways. But Dr. Jobber with Texas AgriLife will be presenting part of that. He's going to focus a lot on maintenance of bioretention systems, which is a lot of um, what's used in these roadway applications. So if you can, can <coughs> make it to that class as well, that would be beneficial. And I'll send out a, a notice to all of y'all about that class. Um, and then additional resources. If you get online, if you Google Green Streets, <laughs> it's, it's amazing the amount of information you'll find. Um, and pretty much everybody has something to say on the matter. EPA has several documents, um, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, there's FHWA's documents, ASHTOs, and then an international BMP database. So there's no, there's no shortage of information on these applications. Um, and it can seem overwhelming at times, but really when you get to the the nuts and bolts of it, they're pretty much saying the same thing um, as far as design and maintenance and things like that. So if you find some good resources that you like, chances are you know, just stick with that one and you'll find most of the information you need there. Um, and so with that, I'm going to start getting into the case studies. I think the first ones are City of Dallas case studies. So we have Dorsey Clark, she's been nice enough to agree to come up here and <laughs> present on some of those. Um, so I'm going to turn and then I'll come back and talk about some of the, the outside of Dallas case studies as well. Okay. Thank you. I'm Dorsey Clark with the City of Dallas and my role there is a project coordinator which read between the lines means not an engineer. <laughs> um, we do have a couple of uh, public works folks here, Tom and Chameen, so um, you know, if it gets too technical. But um, part of my job as a project coordinator is really to encourage the use of ISWAM, um, which is challenging, but we're trying to set a good example with the city, both with um, our projects like recreation centers and fire stations, but mainly also with rights of way. Um, so I'll go through some of the projects. Um, and really just to kind of give a little setting the stage is I think you know most of the cities represented here um, kind of know this story that we were all kind of marching along um, doing roadway design and thinking about how to efficiently get from point A to point B um, but really over the last really less than 10 years there's been a, quite a bit of a paradigm shift and it's come um, because of more information about um, how these projects assist in water quality and quantity with flow. Um, but there's also a lot of stakeholder involvement. And as we walk through, you'll kind of see um, where kind of these pushes are coming from. Um, so now we're looking at um, really more of a complete streets concept. But really, at first, didn't have so much to do with sustainable um, as far as the green infrastructure, but more about accommodating different modes of transit and the aesthetic qualities as well. And that um, has evolved as well. And I want to focus first on the Trinity River because um, it's, it's an interesting part of town that is going through so much transformation and where you have citizens and stakeholders who really want something different. You know, you've got design district on one side, the downtown, and you've got West Dallas and Oak Cliff, you know, just real people that are, that are happy to be down there and want to see change and things to be a little bit different, to have more walkability. So Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge is, is interesting because it was built really as an economic development driver and uh, we have found that to be the case. However, it's really missing the complete streets piece um, and in our next Calatrava Bridge, um, I-30, it, it will contain bike lanes um, and uh, 
pedestrian ways. And so again, you know, how, how can we continue with all of our roadways to expand uses? Um, riverfront's another one that's really interesting that it kind of parallels the river. And um, there, there, there is some actual real green infrastructure, some ice one components, um, and those are the bioswales. And um, a lot of this really came, um, you know, we wanted it, but it was our consultant um, said, well, you know what, we don't have all the right of way in the world, but let's go for it. Let's see what we can get done and what we have. And um, in this case, you know, we're not testing, and in most of the cases as we walk through these, we're not really testing beforehand to say what will the water quality benefit be. However, we know it's the right thing to do, and we're doing it, and particularly in this case, um, we hope to, and we will, we'll, we'll do some water quality testing so that when it's complete, we really can see what the benefits are. And I think that's pretty important. So this goes from um, just north of the Continental Bridge all the way down to Cadiz, and it will be done in two different segments. Oh, there's the, the dipping median that Leslie just described. That's the video. Um, I'm gonna skip to the video. <laughs> Um, Bentley Commerce was interesting. Uh, it was redesigned several times because every time we went out to the neighborhood, they said, no, we want to be able to walk. We want this to look pretty. And we kept doing things and they, it was just not acceptable. So in working with the community, really got something that they were finally happy with. But it, but it took a couple tries um, and it's made us more conscientious as we go out throughout the community, not just in this part of town. So looking at our 2006 projects, um, these weren't all <coughs> intended to have green infrastructure or even to be complete streets. But again, as the design got underway, as we worked with consultants, as we worked with the neighborhoods, um, a lot of them really evolved into some pretty spectacular roadway projects. And I'll go through a couple of these. This one um, on the cover is Greenville Avenue. And some of them as I was going through there, Going through the slides, what, it, what kind of stood out to me is how much kind of accidental I swim we ended up with. And one thing I'll go on a tangent on for a second is we're not doing a great job of tracking these things, which is a shame, but you know, we really need to be. But it's interesting when you go out and you drive around, and I'll show you a picture in a second. Again, this was really complete streets, not necessarily focused on those ice swim qualities, but on everything else. Here's kind of some before pictures. So I took this picture at my local Trader Joe's, and I called the contractor, and I, because to me, I thought, hey, that's looking like it's got some ice swim benefit there. And I said, why'd you do this? Why'd you, well, that's just how we capture the water. Well, did you intend to have any water quality or quantity benefit? Well, not really. So I mean, to me, it was very interesting to see that if any of us walked by, we would think that they were very intentional, but it, it was their way to, to deal with the water, but, but they didn't have a name to it, really. Uh, here's Herbert Street. Um, clearly the street needed some work. And again, kind of accidental ice swim. You know, this, this water, or the water can clearly go into these landscape areas. Um, much, much better walkability, much better greenery. Um, and has really helped with the walkability up for the neighborhood. Congo Street's um, really, really neat project. It was a one block area and very community driven. Um, and this is kind of unusual in that the housing and the roadway got done together, kind of transforming the entire block. Um, and what was interesting is now when you go down there, what you're seeing is people sitting out on their front porches of their new homes looking onto this new street. Tons of pro bono work here. Um, Lyle School of Engineering at SMU uh, worked on it. Hugh Zollers had um, some pro bono design in BC workshop on the architectural piece. So again, here's before. This one did have true bio retention. It had permeable pavers. Um, it really did go on a true diet, street diet. It is now one way. Um, but, but they, in this kind of very small, very um, focused area, kind of threw out everything that green infrastructure and ice swim is about and tried to see what they could do. 
and also to as you can see with the with the homes kind of the different feel is given to this kind of low-income neighborhood and kind of the different community feel that you have because of it you know, real estate council worked on some of these homes as well for one of the projects so elm street elm street is currently under construction it's another 2006 project and this is the elm street portion in deep elm and um, you'll see it's also a complete street um, with all the typical components, including rain gardens and permeable sidewalk pavers. Again, this is kind of our public works working hand in hand with the consultant who really pushed for this and said, let's see what we can get done. Again, let's not measure, you know, we're, we're not measuring what are those water quality benefits going to be beforehand. We're hoping it works. We're, you know, we think, it, we think it'll have some benefit, but it's the right thing to do. So here are the um, pavers that they're looking at. Again, there's some under construction pictures here. Um, I, I'm basically showing several of the drawings just to show how much work and thought went into the ice one components for this particular street, really an evolution, kind of another step, um, and what our expectations are for right of way. These are the rain garden. Again, the key piece of having a landscape architect involved throughout. So here, here's Elm Street and Deep Ellum. Under construction. <laughs> so it'll be complete 2015. Tom, you'll be happy? Very happy. Will <laughs> said there is uh, hands on with it as well. And we have one. Uh, expected look will be. So lastly I want to talk about the 2012 bond program and we really kind of took our expectations to the next level. Um, we had kind of tried things out with the um, Trinity projects and some of those 2006 bond projects and so when we went out and did our 2012 RFQ um, there were basically brownie points, you know points that you could get as a consultant if you had experience in Envision and in ISWIM projects, you know, if you had held a certificate or if you've actually done projects. Um, to that, that was really key for us to know that we had consultants working on projects um, that would be able to carry forward our desire um, to continue to incorporate ISWIM into each of our next um, projects. And it really is a big bond program with regard to streets. Um, and again, there's, there's very targeted complete streets components. And when I say complete streets, now each time it's what will that I swim component be? Whereas before it was kind of an accidental, um, sometimes thought of, sometimes not. Um, so we're really hopeful that this ne the next set of projects, um, Leslie will go into detail as, and one of the one project, but I'm really hopeful that we'll begin to, to learn more and, and know the benefits and that really this is going to become um, the standard way uh, of doing a roadway project rather than it being, oh, an extra bonus or, or an extra thought about kind of thing. Uh, we talked about kind of what you gain from other cities. One thing that I've learned and, and I'm in school in Philadelphia so I keep in touch with people there and from what we understand, they do not do any gray and any piping until you prove that green infrastructure does not work. So it is a completely different mindset that you don't even think about piping unless you, you prove that it's, it cannot be done any other way. And I'm hopeful that we all kind of get to the point that, that doing the high swim and complete streets is just kind of the common practice over time. Thank you. Okay, so the first few projects I'm going to go through, uh, Friesen Nichols has been lucky enough to be able to work on some of these. Um, the first few are also in Dallas as well. Uh, the first one is the South Lamar Street. Um, I'm not sure if any of y'all were able to attend um, the Land Water Sustainability um, LID competition. Um, what, when was that? About last year? It's 2012. 2012. 2012. Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> so that was in 2012. 
Um, it was a competition that was designed to try to promote um, low impact development. There were several different categories and uh, this was the green roadway category. Um, an actual project that the city of Dallas was looking at doing and kind of went out for ideas. You know, what could we do to make this an LID um, project? Uh, so Freeze and Nichols, uh, we were lucky enough to win this segment of the competition. And to make it even more exciting, this actually has turned into a real project, um, a real job. We just submitted 65% plans, I believe. And we have um, an anticipated completion date, design completion of December of this year, and then construction awarded in late spring of next year. So it's nice that it was part of the LID competition because I have lots of good graphics on it. Um, but this is one of those areas where you know your street can only do so much. When we were um, originally looking at Lamar Street uh, or the South Lamar Street project, we looked at uh, delineated the watershed like you would normally do, and we had a 185-acre watershed. That's a very, very large watershed. There's no way that you know this small little segment of street is going to be able to have any kind of applications that would treat that volume of water. Um, so we started looking at what can we do, um, like Dorsey was saying, you know, you might not be able to do everything, but you can do something, and something's better than nothing. So, you know, we kind of took this down um, to about 13 acres, um, which were really less than 10% of the total watershed, but we, you know, realized that that's about what we could treat, um, given the right-of-way space, given the applications that we were installing, that's about um, the drainage area that we could focus on. Um, so this is just some planned views of the design, um, you know, and some things that it incorporates. It's, it wasn't just water quality, it incorporated several different low impact development techniques, but bioretention retention cells being the main water quality aspect. Then you also have, you know, pedestrian amenities, LED lighting, um, intersection improvements, complete street designs, things like that. Um, here's kind of another planned view and profile view of the roadway. We wanted this. Um, we shifted most of the right-of-way to one side to allow for a larger right-of-way that allowed um, a larger green space to implement some of these fire retention cells and then uh, a nice meandering sidewalk there. Um, and if you look down, again, kind of the, the buffer between the pedestrian and the, the, the vehicles, um, you have your fire retention cells. Nice rendering that we had done uh, for the competition. Um, but again, you can see, and this is a very industrialized area. Um, it's on the south side, it's a lot of industrial um, development, and then up on the north side, there's uh, residential. So the street, you know, more so than just creating a buffer between the traffic and the pedestrians, it's kind of creating a buffer between that residential and industrial development as well. Um, so here's just a little screenshot of the 65, some of the 65% plans that we've turned in. And it's been an interesting experience going from you know, something like a theoretical design competition to actual design. Um, we've seen some of the, the new constraints that get, get put on that. So, but we are keeping the bioretention cells in um, that are going to be able to, to treat some of that water quality. So we're looking forward to that benefit. Another one is Merritt Road. This one was in Rowlett. Um, this one has been completed. Um, if you know, Merritt Road is along here. Um, it connects the PGBT. There's no frontage road here, so really Merritt Road essentially acts as part of a frontage road for that portion of the highway. Um, in existing, it was just kind of a, a two-lane, unimproved um, street, large, large residential lots barges on either side, and uh, the plan development was a six-lane arterial, um, and the city was looking for, you know, commercial, higher residential, higher, resi <laughs> higher density residential, um, and when we started the design of this project, it was the city who really came to us and said, you know, we're looking to do something different here. We really want to attract some more, you know, high-tech high end development um, Tell us, you know, shoot us ideas, anything you've got. Um, so we actually went out to our whole company, just sent out to all users' email, asking for any kind of um, design ideas that people had, and we got ideas from every department. It was, it was a really interesting collaboration. Um, but I'll, I'll talk mostly about the stormwater side, because that was the part I was interested in. But 
Um, we did come up with um, the idea of using the biosoils in the medians here as well. Um, again, this was another area where there's a very large offsite drainage area coming towards the street, as there typically is. So you'll see we have, um, you know, this side of the street is grading towards the median, and then half of the street is grading towards the median. And that was because all the offsite flow was coming in over here, the large offsite flow. So we needed to keep that in a traditional system. So we just, that half of the street was graded towards uh, the curb, curb and gutter, and that's how we, we managed that flow. Um, so when you do the median swales, um, you know, this is mostly just grass soil, and then you have a small bioretention cell at the end of the median. Um, with doing the treatment within the median, things that you have to pay attention to are the number of access points. Um, because every time you have a break in that median, now you have to put another bioretention cell, and that can really increase the cost. Um, so there were, you know, some give and take with the developers and property owners around there about where access would be would be granted and you know, where people would have to do turnarounds rather than just having um, breaks in the meeting. Um, also want to pay particular attention, again, our landscape architects about the type of plantings to put in these biosoils. You don't want to grow in too high. That starts uh, to affect the site triangles of traffic. Um, it could be a safety hazard. So that's something you need to pay attention to. Um, just some of the, the planned graphics. Um, from our submitted design, you can see the, we used the rain tanks in this case, um, a proprietary filter media mix, and then these rain tanks um, to help it infiltrate faster, it helped reduce the size of our bioretention cells um, with higher infiltration rates on that soil. Um, here's during construction, um, and I will say, you know, when it, also when it comes to maintenance, during construction is incredibly important. Um, these are fairly sensitive applications when they're in their infancy, when they're being designed, when they're being constructed. And if something goes wrong during construction, then it's going to mess it up the whole way through. But chances are if something's going to go wrong, it's going to go wrong during construction. So you want to make sure there's a lot of monitoring going on. Um, you know, it's something you wouldn't want them to build a bioretention cell first, because then all of the runoff from that site that, you know, whether you have a silk fence or anything else on there, there's probably still quite a bit of sediment getting into that bioretention cell, which can clog it up a lot faster than it's intended to. Um, so that was during construction. This is soon after construction. Um, these are just observation pipes that are going to get cut down. But, um, you can see, you know, coming down the median, enters this infiltration area. There's a little rock check dam there just to help spread the flow. And then any um, excessive storm events get captured into the the overflow inlet. And then there's, once it's completed, um, I thought this was a rainfall event, but it looks like maybe just somebody took a hose to it and <laughs> let it run down there because it's the only thing that's wet. But you'll see the, the curb cuts um, along the median as well for the, the water to get in. So again, the lessons learned, the site triangles, um, you know, your plant selection, that's very important there. Um, contractors should purchase product in advance. That was something that didn't make them too happy from the time that you know it bid to the time they were putting in the ground. The prices um, increased on some of the materials that we were using. That, that never makes them happy. Um, installers available for the um, proprietary device that we use to protect the soil. Make sure um, we used um, construction of the services, their focal point soils. And they do have installers available. They uh, want to make sure it's installed right because they want to be able to say that it's working properly as intended. So they'll come out and help um, during the installation phase. And establishment of planting. So we did have the issue where you know they laid down um, the sod just in the grass soil. There was a big rain event. We didn't have the, the inlets protected and kind of washed all the sod down, <laughs> down the median and ended up in a nice clump right in our bio soil. So. That was something that, you know, you still have to have those protections in place, even though it's just a grassy soil area. Um, East Lancaster, this is a nice, tiny little application. Oh, sorry. No, I'm afraid this one, it looked like it was planned to be six lanes, but it looks like it's constructed as four lanes. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, it is four lanes for now. Um, when we um, started designing, the city realized that, you know, with the um, 
the need for the street right now didn't necessarily warrant those six lanes. So we left space in there for uh, additional lanes to be added in the future, but it's just four lanes right now. On the interior or exterior? Outside? It's going to the out, outside. Was it? So earlier picture showed the additional lanes to the outside. Yeah. in to keep stuff green or alive so, during the drought periods? I need to, so usually it's about two years of when you need um, irrigation just for establishment of plantings. But after that, um, you shouldn't need any. This is the thought. We'll see. It hasn't been in two years yet. Okay. So they did, did build it to use for the, yeah. for the first. Okay. Yeah. Um, East Lancaster, tiny application. Um, it's in the historic Hanley Urban Village uh, streets, streetscape of Fort Worth. Um, pretty much just a one block area. And we put in just a very small, you know, 175 feet of rain gardens. It was one of those things where, you know, they're trying to revitalize the area, make it more pedestrian friendly. And while you're doing that, why not add some water quality aspect to it? Um, so here is the before picture. Obviously, you know, you have these really cute little shops, historic shops on uh, the right over there. But as far as getting to those, not very pedestrian friendly. Uh, everything on the other side of the street um, pretty much looks very industrial and um, not very walkable. So here's one where, you know, it's a tiny, tiny application. Um, we just had curb cuts, the water running into this little vegetated, uh, rain garden area being treated, a little underground there. So what could go wrong here? It's 174 feet. <laughs> um, well, it turns out the contractor didn't, nece or didn't necessarily under design, or mm -hmm. understand the purpose of the rain garden, so they put it higher than the street. <laughs> so it's one of those things you really need to communicate that you know okay, the plans did mean for it to be lower. That wasn't that wasn't a mistake. Um, <laughs> but it is not, it's new in this region, so you know contractors, builders, they're they're not used to seeing that. So yeah, something like yeah, something like putting um, putting it lower behind the curb seems uh, counterintuitive to them. So you know it turned out to be to be raised, but they did go back lower it down and now water can, can get it there. But for a while, yeah, the water just stopped right there. <laughs> Was there any concern with water infiltrating in the subgrade? In the subgrade, typically you put in um, a barrier, um, some kind of uh, liner, yes, they keep um, filter fabric liner um, to keep that from infiltrating, especially on the side of where the street would be. Uh, depending on your application, if you're going to be somewhere within a, in a median, you'd have it around the entire, entire Hopefully not a filter fabric, but a liner. Yes, a yeah. <laughs> liner. Um, the Dallas Urban Reserve, um, this is a residential application um, located in North Dallas, just east of 75 between Forest and Royal. You have a general, it's just this one street uh, development, um, fairly high end development of very modernist homes. Uh, it's about 10 and a half acres, 50 different homes. Very modernist homes, but you'll see there they've uh, done the, the streets. Um, they've had the curb cuts in there, running into this reed and cypress planted medians um, to help treat water quality. They survived through the snow. So that was good. But, you know, two times every decade that it snows in Dallas. Um, and then they also have some wet pond applications too. So it runs through those um, filter. Um, runs through those uh, bioswales and then into the, the wet pond, so you get quite a bit of water quality treatment. Bagby Street, okay, starting to go a little bit outside of the North Texas area now. Now we're in Houston. Um, this was a reconstruction project downtown, so very urban application, uh, major collector, and it was um, the first Green Roads Street in Texas. Green Roads is um, kind of like LEED, and a similar rating system. Um, but it's not 
caught on quite as fast as I think they would hope it would. So you don't really hear about it that much anymore. Um, so here you see the the bio the planted um, boxes bioswales here, and you'll see um, how deep they are. I think uh, that definitely goes to the application in Texas versus things like Portland or Seattle, where they might not have as large a storm events. Um, but yeah, they definitely wanted to be deep enough to to retain some of that water. Um, again, you see those. They have the the little walkways over there. Um, set one area to have it settle out and infiltrate and then if there's very large storm events it comes over here and enters into the overflow inlet. Um, some flow um, diversions, yeah, some weirs to help slow down some of the, the flow transfer through there. Again, just trying to give it time to infiltrate. And then um, signage was really important on this project. I think they did a really good job of it. Uh, they have these nice little stands up here with giving a narrative on the viral uh, retention or rain gardens um, and you know, their purpose and things like that. But also right here where they have the, the concrete stamped. It says, that one says 55,000 yeah, gallons of treated water. So I think that, that definitely helps uh, communicate the purpose of these things to the community and adds a nice little design aspect to it as well. Uh, Brennanwood Drive, another one in the Houston area. Uh, this is in Harris County, just east of Spring. Um, this was another one with a very large drainage area, 27 acres. Um, so they decided that they wanted to go ahead and convey the, the large event as well as hopefully get some water quality treatment out of it. So this is the conceptual uh, version, very early conceptual. Um, you know, fairly large channel, either on the right of way or within the median. Getting, getting a little further into design, you know, they went with the, the median idea. You can see some of the, the conceptual plantings and things like that. And then um, this is final. This has been this has been built now. So um, you'll see here's some of the false back inlets coming in here. Quite a bit of riprap to account for those large storm events. They do have all the water coming into this median, so it's not just what's coming off of the streets, the, the offsite as well. Um, and that goes through a series of kind of, these are kind of like check dams, but they're quite a bit bigger, so that it does provide a lot of retention in those systems as well, and kind of pops from uh, cell to cell um, through those drainage pipes. So there's just um, a few months after construction, you know, again, going through uh, through the system through the wood wrap there. So that's all we have. Um, are there any questions or 